Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simon. It's like diamonds. We are back. This is going to be a good one. All about saltwater kayak fishing. We got a pretty awesome panelist group here. We got Luke, who's about to turn 40 this week. Dude, what in the Getting world? up there. Getting up there. The beard getting a few more gray hairs now? It absolutely is. All, oh. all, uh, all, all, each one of, I've earned each and every one of them. So. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yes. And then, of course, we have Tony, Salt Strong Tony, who's been with us for many years and has been our kayak, internal kayak expert slash resident for really since the day he came on board. We got Mr. Wyatt Parcell, who's also fishing out of a kayak, went from Tennessee to the Carolinas, now over in Texas, where he has been slaying it so far. And Justin Ritchie, our head of tackle, who has won I don't know, probably more kayak awards than anyone else here on this podcast. It even went to the, would you go to the world series of kayak fishing? Yeah, basically I, I got to go to Amsterdam and uh, represent the United States. Woo. Woo. It's cool. <laughs> they offer you a schmuck and a pancake. <laughs> I love gold. <laughs> cool. So we're going live here. Um, I assume the answer is yes, uh, Justin, but we're going live here on Facebook as, uh, as well. So we'd love to hear your questions. We are going to be breaking down, uh, as I said, mistakes, top brands, must have accessories, fish finders, life jackets, paddles, uh, best lures, uh, best kind of setup. And I know Tony's going to bring up some kind of new new ways to transport the kayak that he's been uh, testing out here recently. So you guys ask away. Uh, I'm already seeing some questions uh, coming in. What's up, Ricardo, Jonathan, Joseph, Brad, Brian? Uh, yeah, ask away, guys. So, um, who wants to kick this off? What do you guys want to? Let's let's do mistakes first. Like things that you guys have learned. Uh, it, especially, uh, maybe we'll start with you, Justin, just because you've had to do probably the most kayak fishing underneath pressure and and stress of uh, of tournaments with real money on the line and a lot of pride. Uh, what are what are some mistakes that you see a lot of maybe newer kayak anglers or or even just weekend warriors making? Okay, uh, the biggest mistake, and I've made this mistake many times, uh, and I still sometimes uh, make it today. It's one word, and that's paddle. Do not forget your paddle, because for me, anywhere I go, it's at least an hour drive to get out over to the east coast, and about two hours to get to the west coast. And I can't tell you how many times I've made it to the ramp at 6 a.m. And I have spent two hours the day before rigging all my rods, loading up my, my milk crate or tray or whatever I want to take out on the water with me. And I get to the spot or I get 10 minutes from the spot and I get that pit in the feeling of my stomach like, oh, no, I have no way to get around right now. I've got my pedals, you know, but if I'm too shallow, this was I just wasted an hour drive in the morning. So, uh, you know, it, it always helps to make a checklist. If, you're, if, if you've been doing it for years and years and years, the checklist can come naturally, but do not hesitate to just pull out your phone on a notepad or anything and make a checklist of all of the absolutely necessary items you need out there. What are your safety requirements? Do you, you know, your life vest, your whistle, uh, set of pliers, um, extra spool of leader. We'll go into this in depth, but paddle. You can't really go anywhere without a paddle. <laughs> Yeah, I have to agree with you there. I mean, I've gotten to the point where I keep it in my truck. Like, I get off the water, it goes in my truck, it stays in my truck. <laughs> That's funny. Wyatt, I'm sure you have forgot it, and I know I have Atlanta Luke has, so. Yeah, absolutely. I've forgotten the drive before, too. I mean, there, there's, I've forgotten rods, you know, just have that checklist. Super, super important. Now I arrange all my gear in a way that as I'm kind of making my trip in the morning, if everything's not in my hands, I kind of know it because my paddles get tucked a certain way into my seat. My melt crate sits in my seat when it's packed in the car. So I can kind of look and see if I have all my stuff right then and there. Anything inside the crate could be missing though. So that uh, that checklist is super important. I'll agree there with you, Justin. Cool. Yeah. So what, what are some other uh, mistakes? Hold on, Joe, I got to make a correction. I'm pleased to report I have not forgotten my paddle, but I have forgot my rods on my kayak trip. So I'm able to paddle, but I can't fish. So I've, uh, I've, <laughs> that's an, it's I've called an eco tour. Yeah. So I, I, I always store my, my paddle, the paddle like right on the kayak. So I can't forget it. Same with paddleboard. It's like right there. Um, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. A tip that's related to this and it's a mistake on bringing too much equipment. And I want to hit on this because uh, it was a, 
like a little like a scary ordeal. Um, I was actually out filming with uh, Lisa Fitzgerald when we were doing the uh, the, the course uh, for, for women, and we're we're down in the uh, the like the Ruskin side of Tampa Bay, and and we were but just on filming. She she said, I think I just heard somebody say help, and uh, and we're looking around, and then we see this kayak that we thought was tied to a dock, but turned out a guy had flipped over it. And, and it was cold, it was like literally cold, and he was flipped over and his foot got stuck in the in a rope on his kayak. And so he was like underwater and like he was like, hit a life jacket unfortunately, but his mouth was just barely out of the water. And like, we were like a hundred yards away. And so, um, so we're like, is there somebody in that kayak? We still couldn't see him. And so we drove the boat over and then we could see somebody kind of like moving in the water. and. Uh, Turns out this guy was like in the water for like 20 minutes. We, we finally got to him and he was like, literally like, like couldn't really like move properly and couldn't really talk because he was like legit cold. And all this is Florida. Yeah, it was in, he was in November after a cold front. So it was cold out, but, but he had, we got to him and he had a cooler fell off and that floated off in the mangroves. He had a, a bait bucket. Um, he just had a lot of stuff on a small kayak and like a little boat weight came where we, I told him back to the boat ramp because um, he was like, he was totally done fishing. So anyhow, yeah, he's had too much stuff on his kayak and even a small wake when you're loaded down, like it becomes unstable. So, um, so definitely make sure you have the gear you need, but, but also make sure that you don't have too much gear because it can get dangerous quickly, especially if you're in cold water. So I just wanted to make sure that we yeah. focus on that. In addition to that, make sure you always have a knife on you, like a dive knife, because you're you're basically vulnerable to all sorts of snags and tangles, whether it's fishing line, anchor line, rope, your life jacket, if it happens to get, you know, twisted around or turned around or something like that, a knife will be a, a lifesaver. Or like, like Luke said, that guy got his foot wrapped around the rope. So if you have a lot of stuff that you can get tangled on, make sure you have a knife with you. Or as Captain Mark, a.k.a. Hollywood Johnson, would say, carry a knife wherever you go. We had dinner with him down in the Keys, <laughs> and uh, we needed something. I don't even know what it was. At dinner, at dinner time, it was a nice dinner. And uh, he pulls out his knife, just whips it out. And uh, we're like, why do you carry a knife? He's like, dude, I carry a knife everywhere I go. He's like, you don't? Like, he's like, are you kidding me? He's like, he's like, I got probably 35 of them. I'm like, what? So, yeah, I got like, you know, a certain one. I got to kind of address one for like formal things. I got one for funerals and one for weddings and bar mitzvahs. I was like, what are you talking about? You have a knife for funerals? <laughs> I was like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. But just know that if you're ever hanging out with Captain Mark Johnson, that dude has an knife on him. Um, talk, talk to Tony, because I know you brought this up in a video before, and it's along those lines of what Luke brought up about too much stuff. A lot of people get kayaks. They're super excited and they just start drilling holes in it and putting all these accessories on and they haven't even fished out of it yet. And all of a sudden you're realizing things are getting in the way from you even casting kind of talk through that a little bit. Yeah, that, that's huge. I mean, I made that mistake when I first got a kayak, you know, I went and bought the kayak then I went down the aisle with all the accessories and I was like, holy crap, I want that. I want that. I want that. And then it turns out I didn't need half of that stuff and you end up putting stuff where it's not, like easily accessible or it gets in the way like rod holders for example yeah you need them but don't put it on your kayak right away you need to take that kayak out bring a rod with you bring a net bring your basic tackle and accessories that you would bring and then once you get a better feel for where stuff needs to go then you make a note okay that rod holder would be great right in this spot because once it's drilled in, if it's just a rod holder, you don't have a, a gear track or anything like that where you can slide it up and down. Once you put it in there, it's in there. Then if you have to move it, now you have holes in your kayak. Yeah, you can plug them up, but the less holes, the better, especially if you're on a kayak. That's good. Why? What, what do you got? You've, you've kind of been the most recent to uh, get into kayak fishing and, and upgrading your kayak. What are kind of some lessons learned or mistakes looking back that, oh man, I wish someone had told me this. Yeah, so transitioning from just a straight 
paddle kayak to now I've got pedals. Uh, I would agree with Tony on that, on that as well. Make sure that you take your kayak because I did something similar. I drilled holes in the side of my regular paddle kayak uh, and came to find out if I wanted to put my rod in my rod holder at my side, I wasn't going to be able to paddle because it was in the way. So I ended up having to move it to the center of the kayak and where I, it was just, you know, comfortable and it made sense for it to be there and I could still paddle at the same time. Um, absolutely make it simple. You know, don't bring too many rods uh, and reels. Bring a single tray of tackle. Uh, that's literally the biggest advice I can give somebody is do not bring more than a single tray of tackle. A couple jig heads, a couple hooks, um, weedless hooks, uh, some soft plastics, and, and maybe some hard baits. But you don't need to bring everything onto your kayak. Not only is it going to weigh you down, but it, it's it gets kind of confusing when you bring too much stuff in the kayak because you really can't move around too much. You have to focus on the spots that you're at. If you're switching lures too much, it can just get confusing. We'll touch on that a little bit more, but, but really just make it as simple as possible by bringing out the least amount of stuff that you can. And always, 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 always wear your life jacket. Um, find a life jacket that, that, you want to wear. Uh, don't go out and just buy the cheapest one because it's cheap. Find a nice one that's got pockets that you can put your, you know, forceps on to, uh, or, or your braid clippers, something that you're going to use it that makes you want to wear that life jacket. Because I made the mistake of going out and buying the cheapest one that didn't have any utility to it. Never wanted to put it on. It wasn't, you know, breathable, movable. And uh, if, you know, my kayak had flipped or something, or I managed to knock myself out making a bad cast, uh, I, I would have been in some serious trouble, which People don't think about that. You know, you might be able to, you might be a great swimmer. I knew how to swim before I knew how to walk, but I still wear my life jacket in my kayak because you could literally get knocked. You have no idea what could happen out there. And it's pretty easy to drown if you're not conscious. So make sure you get a life jacket that's got some utility to it and that you always, always wear it. Let's, let's talk about that. What, what brand do you use for life jacket? And then we'll talk about best brand of kayaks. What, what do you use now? So I bought a, uh, a pretty nice Magellan life jacket. It's, you can go to Academy and get them. There's even nicer ones out there, but I, I bought, it's like the most premium one you can buy at Academy, which really isn't that premium, but it's got two nice pockets on the sides. If I wanted to put some tackle in there, in fact, you know, if I, if I clip a, a lure off, if I'm just changing stuff real fast, um, yeah, I can just drop it right in the pocket. Don't got to worry about it. I can keep a spool of leader in there. I've got an extra pocket that I can put my GoPro batteries in. Um, there's a clip to tether my phone to, which is another big thing. I've lost my phone twice in my kayak and I'll show you guys, actually, I don't know if I have it on me, but I've got a phone tether now. Definitely need to get one of those for your phone so you don't drop them. But, uh, it's just the Magellan pro it's like a pro angler vest. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's got, um, the arms are cut uh, to where you've got a lot of mobility. The padding on the back is set up where you can sit against a kayak really comfortably. Um, so it's, it's just designed for the kayak angler. Recommend you go and find one that's got utility. Otherwise, you're just not going to wear it. I can tell you from experience. Tony, what do you use? I have a, um, it's an automatic inflatable one, but it's not an ideal one for kayak fishing because it's water activated. So what I would recommend is getting, if you want one of those simple, you know, automatic inflating life jackets, get one that is pressure activated because there's a bunch of splash and stuff going on when you're fishing from a kayak or you might get rained on. And if it's water activated, that little, uh, it's a little cap that's inside that when it gets wet, it expands and it pushes that pin into the CO2 cartridge and it'll just expand without you realizing it. Get the pressure activated it's actually uh, activated when you fall into the water the pressure from the water causes it to you know inflate so i would recommend that it's lightweight it's comfortable the only problem is they're really expensive they can run you know upwards to 200 300 depending on the brand but your life's worth it you know it's just like the epurbs that guys get fishing offshore. Yeah. It's a couple hundred bucks, but it'll sa save you a lot in the long run. And then I also have, a, I think I have the exact same life jacket you have, Wyatt. The, it's, it's a Magellan from uh, Academy Sports and Outdoors, but with those solid life jackets, really get something that you can move around in. The paddling vests, they have, you know, the room for your arms. They have the higher up uh, padding in the back. So when you sit back in your seat, like Wyatt said, you can sit back and not have to you know, press against the pad of the life jacket. So those are the two that I have. 
Cool. Justin, you've done a lot of tournament fishing. What did, what did you use? What do you find was best and most comfortable for the long days in a kayak? Uh, I'm pretty, min I'm pretty minimalist like you guys as well. I prefer to have a pressurized one or one with just a pull tab that'll inflate if needed. Um, I don't really like a lot of clutter on my body for most of, most of the fishing that I'm going to do inshore. I'm so shallow. I'm in a foot of water most of the time. I don't think I'll ever be in anything deeper to where I can't see the bottom in two feet or two and a half feet. So it, when I'm fishing the flats and I'm shallow, I have a, a Hobie inflatable life vest. Um, and like, like Tony said, it's pressurized and there's a pull release tab that I can pull on it to be able to engage a CO2 cartridge and, and, and puff up. Um, when I'm offshore, uh, especially in rough conditions, if it's like two to three foot, I'll have a, I have a Coca tat that I, I use. Um, it's got a lot of accessories on it and things I can clip and, and store a knife and store other things. And I think um, when it's two to three feet and you're in 300 feet of water and you're panicking, if you fall out of your kayak or you take a rogue wave, I'd rather have something that's already big and poofy to keep me afloat in case I'm going to panic and try to get back onto my kayak and flip back over. Uh, I just have that security of, of having one that's already ready to go. But most of the time, if I'm on the flats and I, I'm standing up and I've got my rod kind of in my pant pocket to where I've, I'm ready to grab it and make a cast at a fish when I see it, I don't want a lot of things in the way, but I still will wear it because it's pretty low profile and it doesn't you know affect me casting or standing up and pulling around. Cool. Um, Luke, let's switch over to top kayak brands. There's never one, just like with reels or rods or anything, there's a lot that goes into it. I think most of us would agree, you know, if you had $6,000 to spend on a kayak, you might get the latest and greatest crazy pedal drive and all this stuff from a Hobie. Uh, then again, you got kayaks like Vibe, because uh, we have both in our family. Uh, Vibe's a whole lot cheaper, uh, but you miss out on a lot of the stuff that a, a nice uh, Hobie would have. And there's a lot in between. I know you've, like you played around with a, a new one as well. Uh, down at the condo, what, what do you, what do you like? And we'll kind of hit everybody. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the Hobie has been really nice. So we have at least, you know, our, our dad has a, a Hobie and I think it's a 13 footer. I can't remember how long it is. And then um, I got a, a old town um, a little bit ago. And those are the two pedals that I've used and pedal kayaks are a game changer for years. I was using, um, I got a heritage back in high school. That's still old heritage. Yeah, those, and we have multiple heritage, and, and yeah. uh, I got it literally in high school. It's still working. It's still in good shape. It was like three hundred dollars, and so like that was a really good value. Um, but once I got to once I started with the pedal drive, that's just a total game changer. If you're fishing deeper water, you can. If you're fishing docks or something or mangroves, you can you know hook into a big fish. You can actually have the leverage to pedal away and get more leverage on getting that fish out. And you can just you can just fish while you're pedaling again, which is something I never for 20 years of kayak fishing was never able to do. Um, it just costs a lot more. And, and so if, if you are serious about it, the pedal drives are worth it. If you're just going out every once in a while, it's probably not um, because I, I caught a lot of fish out of my normal kayak. And that little heritage was like a little 10 footer. It was a little small one. It doesn't paddle very far, but it got the job done. And in many cases, that's what that's all you really need. You just need something that floats. And, uh, and you can paddle out to a flat and get out and wait. And that's what I did most of all on, on that small kayak, on the little heritage, I would just paddle out. I would take a rope, take a couple rods and I would paddle out to a good flat. And then I would hop out, I have my wading boots on. I would tie the kayak to myself and then I would go wade, you know, the, the entire flat. And then that way the tackle is always with me. Uh, if the fish weren't there, then I can just hop back in the kayak and, and go find another spot. So um, there's so many options, but like, the, the Hobie was awesome. The Old Town was, it's, uh, it's not, like it was the, the Old Town Outback. Um, not as well known, but I love it. Like it's, uh, and now Kayak, now Wyatt actually has it, uh, but it's awesome. Um, I would just really wasn't using it uh, much. So, uh, so Wyatt, uh, Wyatt's now taking good, uh, good care of it. And uh, it's, it's, it's been, I've been very happy with it. And it's a lot less expensive than, than some of the others out there. Yeah, I remember my, my first one was, uh, it was made by Element, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is just so you know, Luke and I work, we were kayak fishing before it was cool. This is like 1997 ish. Yeah, I got mine in 90s. I think it was 97. 97. Yeah. The element and the heritage and still have mine as well. Still sitting at the condo and gets used about once a year. 
but what not to do is if you're getting, if you're getting one and if you're just going to use it a few times a year type thing, which is again, which probably most people, um, and you're storing it, don't store those kayaks on those, like those kayak racks that, that has the, all the pressure on to just two spots. In many cases you lay, lay it flat and you have the whole, the whole, uh, weight of the kayak on those two spots. Cause Joe's heritage, um, sat for probably a couple of years because, because you know, that was heavy. That element was big and bulky and heavy where these yeah. little heritage ones were, uh, were really light and easy to use. So we were, we would use the ones that are easier to use. Yeah, it was the last, it was the last one to ever get used and it yeah. just sat there and. And so it was sitting on those little pilings and then we finally did use it and, and the bottom was so warped. Uh, it's, it's surely <laughs> out of commission. I know we tried to, to reverse it, but the, the, just that weight sitting on there, that plastic eventually kind of kind of caved in, if you will. Yeah, it, literally like two teepees on, in the, it's nuts. Yeah, so store it like laying flat on the ground or um, something better than just on two little points. All right, what do, you, what do you guys, who's next in terms of favorite overall brand? So I would like to chime in about if you are looking to just get into kayak fishing and you want to do it really cheap, get on Facebook Marketplace and find you one of those Pelicans. Those Pelican Angler 100Xs or Pelican uh, catches, super easy way to get into the kayak fishing game. It's actually what I did when I moved to North Carolina from Tennessee a super cheap kayak and it got me to the flats uh, so that I could go after those reds and some slower moving water um, and even get in the back creeks, go after some flounder. Where I will say that those kayaks are going to be a little bit more difficult to use is when you start going after some, some trout uh, in the coastal marshes where they typically hang in heavier current, it gets really difficult to fish those types of areas. Uh, when you got five foot tide swings and, and you're in a kayak that you can't fish and control your vessel at the same time. That's where this new Old Town, I'm gonna to correct Luke, it's the Old Town Topwater. The Outback is Hobie's, um, Hobie's model. But uh, yeah, that, that, that Old Town Topwater is, uh, is awesome. I will address a con that it has, is uh, it's got the propeller blades, which work great uh, you know, in terms of movement, except when you're over grass or you're going through grass flats. If there's any grass floating around and it gets caught up in those propeller blades, you're gonna have to lift the drive and pull them out. I know Tony uses the, uh, I'll let Tony tell you about his drive, but I, I'm guessing he probably has less issues with that type of scenario than I do with the propellers. So Tony, you wanna take it on? Uh, what are you using? Yeah, I've got the Hobie Outback, the newer, it's a, well, it was a 2019. Now I have a 2020 hole because the hole I, I got replaced under warranty. They gave me a new one. But um, as far as the, the pedals go, they're a fin. So they're not a propeller. They're fin uh, propulsion system. And it doesn't really get snagged on grass. Uh, usually when I'm that shallow, we do what we call flutter kicking, where the fins basically just flap to the sides and up against the hole. So you have that option as well. So don't really get too much grass. Uh, before that kayak, I had the Jackson Kusa FD. That was a nightmare uh, with grass and also just the drive itself. I don't know if they've made it better now, but that drive I replaced, I think, six times over a, a year time span. What, so did, you, what did you have before the Jackson? The Jackson, I had a Old Town... No, the Ocean Kayak, a Prowler Big Game too. That's right. That was probably my my favorite kayak that I've had. But um, as far as you know, brands and all that, when you're starting out, you don't need a lot. You know, it's just like boats. Even if you have the money, you shouldn't go out there and get a 36 foot yellowfin. You know, <laughs> if you have the money, start small because you want to know what you like. You don't know what you like until you start getting into it. And uh, I started out with a 14 foot. It was made by Perception. It's a really skinny kayak. Paddled really fast, caught a ton of fish on it. But after a little while, I realized, okay, I want something a little better. So I sold that one for almost as much as I bought it for. And then upgraded to the, uh, that was a, yeah, the Ocean Kayak was my next one. That one was great. I could stand up in it. It paddled really well. Then I was getting sick of paddling. So I sold that one, got just about as much as I paid for it. And that's when I moved into the pedal drives. And I went from the Jackson to the Hobie just because of those issue, uh, issues with the pedal drive. You know, Hobie is pretty much the pioneer of pedal drive kayaks. And I've had 
pretty much zero issues with that over the past year, year and a half that I've had it. Are you, are you getting a premium when you sell them because you're advertising that, Hey, this is Tony's kayak fishing, Tony's kayak or. No, I'm not, not sponsored or affiliated with those guys. No, I was just saying in general, like, you know, I'd pay a premium, like, you yeah. know, if you bought a celebrity's Design house it? or a car, you know, you said like like oh, as far as selling mine. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't sell them for more than what they're worth. <laughs> what was the Seinfeld episode when George uh, thought he got so and so's car and the pencil? Yeah, the, the... yeah what was the name? <laughs> oh, oh so me. funny! That's and they went me. to go track him down to have him bite a pencil to see if it was his bite marks. Or the yeah, yeah. If I got the dentist, yeah. If anybody can remember that one, please leave a comment down. It's, it's killing me right now. Uh, I think the the ocean kayak I did sell to one of our members. Um, I used to have an L two fish board. I sold to one of our members. Yep. Um, what else did I sell? I think that's it. Still have the Hobie. That's not going anywhere anytime oh, soon. Yeah. All right, <laughs> Justin. I know you were in the whole Hobie World Series. Was is that what you fished out of? I assume. Yeah, I ventured into having my first Hobie in 2014. I bought a 2014 hole with my tax return, and I have never looked back. Um, I started with a perception like 12 foot kayak I got at Dick's many, many, many years ago graduated college, used up some savings and just bought a, you know, inexpensive 12 foot sit on top at, at Dick's. And, uh, afterwards I, I don't know, I, pr I probably made it like two or three years, went over to a Malibu, fished out of a couple Malibu kayaks. And when starting to do tournaments and even, you know, through the summer months when the rainstorms would kick up or in the winter time, when the winds were high, I got tired of fighting the elements. I got tired of paddling back to the ramp in the wind. I got tired of fighting the tides I got tired of having to paddle, you know, really shallow water. If I was out deep, I'd have to deal with waves and paddle. And I would just spend so much energy to make it from A to B. I didn't think it was efficient. So I, I got into a Hobie uh, and I thought the Outback was the way to go because it's still streamlined like a kayak. I thought the Pro Angler was just a little too big. It might be tough to launch if I were to go off the beach and, uh, you know, out, out offshore. But the Outback gets it done. I, I've got like a little trick I can do in the Outback. I stand up and <laughs> we're going to talk about kayak tricks. We'll segue into that in a minute, but the one trick and Tony, you got to tell me if you do this, man, the rudder for an Outback is on the left-hand side of the boat. And when you're standing up, do you ever like in between your big toe and your first toe control the rudder with the wind to your back to kind of pivot and steer and drift? Cause that is the most handy thing ever. If I've got the wind in my back and I'm standing up on the kayak and I can see everything in front of me and I'm trying to sight fish and I see potholes or I'm looking for redfish against a, you know, a mangrove shoreline with some sand to the left and I'm drifting and I see one to the left, I can just with my toe, just pivot, catch the side of the wind and make a cast. I don't have to correct with my paddle. I don't have to use a push pull. It's just my big toe, man. The big toe gets not, it done. You, Tony yeah. wears boots. You not wear shoes or anything? <laughs> no. No, you're trying to that's protect so, your... That's so primitive. <laughs> and real all... quick, Stephen Carter, John Voight, you nailed it, dude. That's yeah. was, why was, Luke and I were laughing. Yeah. John Voight. Yes. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny on the, the toe. Um, no, I've, I've never done that. What? Dude, it is, it's a game changer. What I swear. Years? I have a 2017 and a 2018. I have two of them. And okay. they're both... Yeah, they're both like, I don't know if the new one changed or not. Yeah, we have rudder controls on both sides on the gunnels. I don't know if you're left-footed or right-footed, but <laughs> like you got both options now. Is that a thing? <laughs> left-footed <laughs> or right-footed? <laughs> uh, no, I use my paddle, like, just to push the the rudder control. Yeah. I'll do that, or I'll use the butt end of my rod, push it while I'm standing up. Yeah. When I'm pulling around, I'll stand up and use the paddle, use a push pull. But if I got the wind in my back, it's just a quick, it's a quick pivot thing. I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to make a video and show it. But to answer your question, I I'm, I'm an avid kayak fisherman. That's what I, that's what I love to do. Um, and I've just invested really heavy in the sport. I have two Hobie Outbacks and uh, I, I cover a lot. One, of one for each foot. <laughs> one for each foot. <laughs> I cover a lot of water. So, I mean, it's not uncommon for me to put in, you know, 10 or 12 miles or more, sometimes 14 miles, you know, in a full day or in six hours of fishing, because I'll, you know, if I'm going to make a day to go out and just sight fish, 
Uh, I might only make 25 casts, but I'm going to cover miles and miles and miles of water to find fish before I just blind cast out on the open flats or blind cast at this structure and that structure. But it's just the areas that I fish. And uh, especially if I were to go offshore, a paddle kayak offshore is tough because you have to fight the current. And um, there've been many times, even in a pedal kayak where I've ridden the current, you know, four or five miles north of my launch area. And uh, in the summertime and late summer, the current will kick up to three, three and a half knots or more offshore. And it's rough. I mean, anybody can tell you, I think William Centrone is in the chat. He's an offshore, offshore kayak guy. And he'll, you know, he'll, he'll eventually speak up and say, yeah, fighting against that current when you're in 300 feet of water is not fun uh, in any kayak pedal or pedal, but you get, you get more speed and you, you spend less energy in a, in a pedal drive of any sort, whether it's a Hobie, you know, Mirage drive fins, or it's like the impellers that are on the natives. They're on, uh, man, they're on a bunch of different kayaks now. All these different manufacturers have that style. Um, but I think Pelican, Lightning Kayak, Hobie, they have the fin style nowadays. And uh, something else that's pretty important that I wanted to bring up is, you know, many people that are kayak fishermen, they're usually fishermen before they're kayakers. So if you do get into a paddle kayak, you just need to be aware of, or just know your capabilities. You know, if you go three miles one way, that's another three miles you have to come back, possibly more. So know your limitations, know what you're capable of. Um, it's quite a workout when you do get out there and you know, you, you've covered 10, 12 miles round trip, uh, just between sitting down and standing up or both. And just, just make sure you know what you're getting into if you do get into kayak fishing. Let's, that's let's really, go. yeah, go for it, Wyatt. I was going to say, that's really where that paddling.com can come in and absolutely save you. If, if you're a kayak angler and you don't know about paddling.com, Tony is the one that, that turned us on to it. Uh, it's an absolute lifesaver being able to look at all these different kayak launches. If you've got a spot that you want to go hit, you can go on paddling.com and see tons of different launches that people have inputted. Some people aren't even fishermen that are putting in those kayak launches. So, you know, you get a really broad range of areas you can launch from. Um, and when I was in North Carolina, access to water was really privatized. And it's kind of tough to know exactly where you can launch, where you legally can. Uh, so that site was really helpful in finding locations um, on such privatized access, uh, just because, as Tony said, uh, you can be making some very serious journeys to get to a good spot. Um, and, and while it is worth it, if you can save yourself, um, you know, energy and time, you know, if you've got two, three hours to be on the water on a weekend uh, before everybody wakes up or whatever, you don't want to spend an hour paddling to your spot. Uh, so finding the closest launch to that location, obviously planning that with the, the current and the wind for that day, um, save yourself a lot of time and energy for sure. I've seen a few people have brought this up and it was on my notes to talk about adding a trolling motor and or power pole. My personal take is at some point you add all this stuff on and you got an $8,000, $10,000 kayak. Why not just go buy a used GNU and call it a day? Uh, that's just me. What do you guys think? in terms of trolling motors and, and power poles versus just stick it pins. What do you got, Wyatt? So I actually went out with an insider who got a trolling motor at a yard sale. Steven Andrews in North Carolina probably had the slickest, cheapest rig for a trolling motor on a kayak I've ever seen. It's like a $30 trolling motor he got. He rigged it up in a, in a waterproof battery holder right on the back of his Vibe. I, I can't remember if he had a Vibe kayak. And then he just cut some two by fours and uh, got some some clamps clamped it to the side of his kayak and man he was just he just had his finger back behind his head controlling the handle and it was like i don't know how much money he spent on that whole setup but it had to have been less than a hundred dollars and he was absolutely burning me and i had the pedals and he was just no effort it was the it was the coolest thing I've, I, i'd ever seen and it folded over when he wasn't using it so it wasn't in his way for casts um, maybe Steven, I don't know if he'll, he'll watch this, but I'd love to get the plans for that again. Cause I really, <laughs> it was really nifty. What about the rest of you guys? So I'll touch on the power pole versus anchor pin real quick. Cause I've, I've contemplated getting one of the, the micro power poles for my kayak, but the only problem I see with that is that you're stuck in one position. When you anchor down, you you're stuck either with the current to your back going down, you're facing whatever, whatever direction the wind or the current's going. 
with an anchor pin, if you combine an anchor pin with an anchor trolley, you can anchor yourself and then you can position yourself how, however you want with the anchor trolley, as opposed to just an anchor pin or the uh, power pole in the back. You push a button, it's nice and easy and that it's nice and quiet, you stop immediately. But if you're you know, going this way and you put the power pole down and you're trying to fish in front of you, next thing you know, the wind is turning you around. Now you're, you're just not in the right position. So that, that's my biggest uh, issue with the, the power pole versus like a stick it pin or an anchor like that. So Sydney Sewell's on here. She could, she needs to come on and teach all of us something about kayak fishing. Girl knows how to catch some fish. Uh, what yeah. about you, Justin? Power pole, troll motor, or micro power pole, whatever you guys are calling it these days. What you, what you got? I, uh, I, I've had a power pole on two different kayaks on two different outbacks. And it's a nice feature to have when doing tournaments and you want just that little extra added security of knowing you can stop on a dime. Um, but Tony is absolutely right. Unless you're going to be drifting with the wind and having the wind to your back, if you're going to be paddling into the wind or any kind of crosswind, then you want to position yourself when you're targeting certain fish or certain areas that you want to fish, that wind is just going to spin you around and you're going to be facing downwind anytime you drop that, drop that micro. It's like a seven or $800 unit. Um, the pole that comes with it is I think seven or eight feet long. And I've had it chopped down to like four or four and a half feet so that I'm not having all this sway when I'm out on a windy day, I, I take the pole and I've chopped it down to where it's half the height because I'm not in water that's deeper than two and a half or three feet. So it's much easier to have a much shorter pole, but uh, overall, I think it's a really nice feature to have, but I don't know that it's necessary. I think you can, kayak fishing is simplistic. And I mean, it's a, it's an $800 bell and whistle. Like it, it's a really pretty penny to invest into getting that. And I think the aftermarket mount could be anywhere between like 50 bucks to 60 bucks to put on the back. Um, but in tournaments, it's helpful. If I'm standing up and I'm drifting a big flat and I see a fish cruising or I see a tail pop up and I want to stop right in that moment, I don't want to go anywhere and think about my next plan of attack. I can tap, tap, drop the power pull down and sit and think for a second. So it's helpful to have, but in terms of, you know, most day-to-day -day fishing, uh, you're not going to lose sleep if you don't have a power pole and you don't stop on a dime and you drift over redfish and you spook it out. It's not the end of the world. You're going to find another redfish, you know, have a small stick it pole, or, I mean, I had used a claw anchor dumbbell for years, just an old fashioned with a rope. A rope is very handy. Mm -hmm. uh, just tie like 10 or 15 feet on a rope and throw out a claw anchor and just stop. Um, but over, over time I've used either my, uh, my stick it pin. I basically took the spear from the power pole micro that I don't use on one of my kayaks and tie a rope to it. And I'll just stick it in the ground when I want to stop. Um, or if I'm really shallow and I want to stop more conveniently, when your fins are flush against the kayak in a Hobie Outback and you half flutter them, you'll catch the grass a little bit and your fins can serve as, a, as an anchor as well. So you don't have to grab the stick it and put it in place and grab, you can just move your fins a little bit and you'll hold still and you know you have a rod in your hand ready to cast. Um, yeah. Cool. So Did you ever, do you ever put a troll motor on any, any kayak? No, well, in, in tournaments, you're not allowed to have a motorized, you know, trolling motor or any kind of motorized piece on a kayak. It has to all be manpowered. You have to either through, you know, paddling or pedaling. Those are the only two things that are allowed in, in fishing tournaments. Um, so I, for that reason, I never got one. But now as I get older, I, I can, you know, especially if I'm offshore and I want to get up and go or I want to troll a little bit, you know, it's, it's a good thing to have. I think if you're going to, if you're going to be offshore or if you're in, a, in an area with, that's open water and rough conditions, even if you're pedaling, you know, the trolling motor will just help you get from A to B that much faster, save all that energy and use that energy fishing and not fighting the elements. Um, but I'm not very tech savvy and I'm not very rig savvy on my kayak. I don't like popping holes in the kayak. It's just a weird fear that I have. So I know I can work with somebody to do it right, but I haven't needed it for most in inshore needs. Cool. Let's move on. I saw Max and Mike were debating depth finders, fish finders, any kind of electronics. I know, Tony, you've played around with a couple. I think we did a review a while back. What do you guys think? It comes up a lot in our insider club. What, what are your thoughts on best depth finders for kayaks, fish finders, whatever you guys are calling them these days? 
So something with, if you do get into fish finders, something with side, uh, side scan is going to be your best option just because of how shallow you're fishing uh, with a kayak, but it's not necessary. It's just like the, the, the power pole, you know, it's nice to have, but it's not really necessary. It has its advantages and disadvantages. You know, if you're sh fishing shallow flats where you can s see everything that's going on, you don't need a fish finder. But let's say one day you want to go fish a bridge and look for schools of redfish and drum or snook around bridges, that's where a fish finder is going to come in really handy. Um, and it, it just opens up different opportunities at different areas to fish, like deeper channels, bridges, docks, and stuff like that. But if you're primarily fishing flats, you really don't need one. Uh, the one I use, I have a Simrad. It's a Go 5. It's a five inch screen. It has side scan, down scan, GPS, all the bells and whistles even has, you know, you can plug in an engine to it and it gives you all the readings for the engine, but obviously don't have an engine on a kayak, but you can find some uh, cheaper models out there. This one went for, I think it was 500 bucks total for the side scan, the transducer unit, everything and mounting it. You know, that's again, you want to make sure you mount it in the right place. You don't want it in the way. Uh, from either fishing or paddling or pedaling. So um, that's what I use, the Simrad Go 5. And I take it off the kayak. It's only on the kayak, maybe 10% of the time I'm out on a trip. Again, I only use it if I know I'm going to be fishing deeper water. Yeah, I think that's, you nailed on the head there. And like, if you look at the bass, you know, term the kayak, you know, it's a fast growing uh, part of that sport and they all I mean they would they wouldn't even think twice about not having some type of fish finder but they're doing a lot of offshore you know they're looking for deeper structure and if you're only in three feet of water you know sight fishing that it, it's just kind of worthless what about you Justin were you guys allowed to use them in the tournaments in the offshore tournaments yeah oh yeah it's it's yeah. it's like a huge must have necessity yeah it's a must have when you're offshore um, sometimes you're you're jigging areas that are only a, a couple hundred feet wide. And when you're offshore and you've got current blowing you past, you need to be able to mark on your fish finder and your GPS path um, before you get up to that piece of structure that you're going to jig or you're going to drift a live bait. You need to be up current of it and time it. I mean, having an electronic offshore uh, charting your, your path and determining what depth you're in is key because these fish run in highways. They could be in the bite could be in 180 feet of water. And if you're in 200, 220 feet of water, you're not on the bite. And if you don't know what depth you're in, then you can't consistently get back to that same depth with the fish we're biting at. Offshore, it's all about lateral highways of, of depths that they had. Once they find a depth, they stay within that range by about 10 feet or 15 feet. But for shallow water, the only time I use my, my fish finder, and I have a bigger one and a smaller one on each boat, uh, is just at Hallover and just at Bridges, like Tony said, you know, over on the East Coast, if we want to go for big black drum this time of the year, uh, a fish finder is really helpful because you'll, you could be dropping a piece of crab or a shrimp around a corner of a piling or an area that looks like it's good structure, but for the areas that we fish, it could be nothing, 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 and all of a sudden a hundred fish pop up below your kayak, and it could be a fish, you know, like fishing in a barrel. So there are times that having electronics are a really big you know tool to have in your back pocket but it's usually when you're in anything about deeper than like eight or ten feet of water what, what brands do you use i have a I have a garmin striker pro or garmin striker 4 on one of the kayaks it actually came with one of the kayaks when i bought it uh, and then i have an old elite a lawrence elite 5 xdi or something it's a discontinued model now they make like chirp they make like an elite uh, a chirp two or something. Uh, one's like seven inches and the other one's a little four inch screen. And I will say that if you're offshore and you're going to be in deep water and you really need to see your fish finder clearly, having a big screen is nice, but it's not necessary. Having a small four inch screen will do just fine. You don't have to have a five or $700 unit. You can make do with a $150, $200 unit and a cheap transducer. As long as your transducer can read the range that you're going to be fishing, you can, you can get out there and, and see just what everybody else is seeing and save a lot of money. Cool. That's good. Wyatt, any comments? I actually have never outfitted any of my kayaks with a fish finder. As I said, I, I had the, the very basic Pelican pedal kayak for a long time. So I, I didn't really, number one, have 
the ability to mount one. I guess if I had created an elaborate rig and drilled a bunch of holes, I could have, but for me, it was never really worth it. Cause I was fishing these, uh, these coastal marshes that were, you know, on the open mud flats, like for a foot to maybe three feet deep, um, in the deeper creeks, uh, I could see where they could have been beneficial, um, at some holes to check and see if there were fish sitting at the bottom of those holes where they were a little bit deeper, but usually I could feel those holes out really quickly with a couple of casts, um, and, and kind of know if there were fish there or not. Uh, so for me, fishing inshore, never really fishing, you know, actively fishing more than, uh, than probably like Justin said, eight feet. I never had the need to put a, a fish finder on there. I can always check. I've got a, the paddle that I have has a measurement stick on the side of it. Uh, so I can get a general range of what depth I'm at, which is really what's most important for me is knowing how deep it is uh, in dirty water. Cause you know, you could be in two feet of water and it'd be the same water clarity that 12 feet of water is um, further down the intercoastal in the Carolinas here in Texas. Now I, I can actually see the bottom. So I know if I'm shallow versus deep, but knowing what's deep water and what isn't, if, you know, I, I don't open up Google Maps and look at the, uh, the, the actual depth changes on there, I find that you can get it done just as well with the paddle. Um, and I'm not usually going to be looking for fish on a fish finder in, in, in water that shallow. So I've never had to use a fish finder when I fished. Cool. Do it the way the Native Americans did, just an old stick. Um, mm -hmm. Sydney Sewell, good friend who is quite the angler. What's the best advice you could give to a kayaker that's mainly a bass angler, which she is, that's wanting to get more into inshore fishing? Well, Sydney, step one is just admitting you have a problem and it's bass and you realize there's a, a brighter future ahead and in inshore saltwater fishing. Uh, Tony, why don't you handle that one since you kind of fit that mold? You were a, a, a bass angler and then got into the inshore saltwater and kind of got addicted to it. What's, uh, what's like a, some good transition tips? Yeah, so pretty much everything that you you use for bass fishing can transition to inshore fishing from a kayak. Uh, I bass fish from a boat and then transitioned both to saltwater and kayak fishing. So it was a, a little bit different for me. You know, I had to definitely minimize uh, my gear. You know, you can't bring seven or eight rods on a kayak. You can't bring 10 tackle trays worth of tackle with you. So I I found I was bringing just too much stuff. Also, my line was way too heavy. You know, bass fishing, I was used to using 40, 50 pound braid and inshore 10 pound is all you need if you're fishing the flats. 10 pound braid, you can cast further. And as far as finding fish goes, you know, this that's where it's a little bit different. You know, bass, they live in a different environment than redfish, trout and snook do. But if you're fishing for trout and snook, they exhibit some of the same feeding behaviors as bass do. You know, they're ambush predators. They'll hit topwater lures. They'll, they'll hit pretty much the same lures that, you know, inshore, inshore fish and bass will. So that transitions very nicely. Um, as far as, let's see, I'm reading the question here. I think the one thing that's always the same, because, you know, we live on a lake. Uh, my wife and I are across the street from one. And I do a lot of bass fishing. And the one thing that's always the same in saltwater and bass fishing is structure, right? That's, I'm always trying to maximize the structure. That big old, I don't know if you guys saw that big old lunker bass uh, that I caught just last week, same deal. I, I guess what was around there? It was a ton of structure. It was nasty, gnarly stuff. I had a weedless uh, slam shady bomber on and there was tons of little bait around. So, I mean, those are two things that are always gonna be congruent is try and, and it doesn't always work 100% of the time but if you can maximize your structure you're going to maximize the chances of finding some some predator fish and especially if there's bait around yep fish are fish they act the same way they're doing the same thing they're either trying to eat or they're trying to stay alive so if you can just focus on those two things and you'll have a good chance of getting on some fish inshore reminds me of a song from the bg staying alive who wants to sing it with me anybody anybody yeah you can count me out on that one. Oh, come on, Tony. I'm sure you got a great voice. So I've heard, but <laughs> you used to be in a band, didn't you? We got to pull up a picture of you and your long hair and your band days. <laughs> Justin's like, what did I get myself into? Oh, man. 
Um, let, let's, I've seen a couple of questions in here about just this overall setup, right? You mentioned some mistakes earlier about kind of what not to do, maybe not having a rod holder right next to you where you're trying to paddle. Like, how do you guys, knowing what you know now about uh, kind of a, a maximized kayak, how do you like to set it up? How many different rod holders, how many rods you bring, where are you keeping your tackle trays in between your legs? Is it behind you? You bring in a cooler? What's, uh, what's the kind of the ideal setup? I think uh, probably my my recommendation is no more than three rods, ideally two. Um, if there's a lot going on, there's a lot of different variables that could be affecting what fish are feeding on, um, which there usually isn't. It's usually due to really extreme temperatures or winds that I will bring out three rods. Uh, but on your average day, I'm only going to be bringing out two, one for shallow water, one for deep water. Um, and maybe the exception to that, where I would bring three on an average day is if it's, there's top water conditions. Um, you know, if we're, we're in a season that does allow for that, just cause I love always having a top water tied on, uh, if the season does allow for it. Um, but I would say, you know, the, the general setup that you need is just a 2,500 to 3000 class reel. Um, something that is very saltwater resistant because you're going to get wet in that kayak. Another piece of equipment you absolutely need to have is a water bottle that you can either poke a hole in with that knife that you always carry around, Captain Mark Johnson, mm. or uh, a water bottle that's got a spray lid that you can put fresh water on those reels on whenever they get soaked, dunked, whatever, because I can guarantee you they're going to get salt water on them. So 2,500 to 3,000 class size reel um, and, and a rod that you're comfortable handling in tight spaces. One that I've had a lot of uh, success and I really like a lot is this Mojo Yak just because of the short butt. Um, not necessarily my favorite rod in the world, but in terms of maneuverability on a kayak, uh, this thing is like, I love it so much. Um, but, you know, there's tons of different rod sizes and classes out there. Um, I, I think a uh, seven foot seven, six is probably the, the sweet spot. That way you can cast far and still have a good control of your cast without going into too long of a rod. Um, but, but still getting good distance, uh, light line, 10 pound test, um, and, and really search baits. That's your biggest thing with, uh, with, with kayaks is you're covering a lot of water. Um, you need to be assessing areas quickly. Paddle tails have been my number one bait out of a kayak. Um, and then if I am getting up close and personal with fish, some sort of stick bait, a uh, gulp shrimp or a jerk shad is, uh, it, it are really my top lures, I would say. So paddle tails, stick baits, um, on those setups that will literally take care of everything you could possibly need. We, I'll, I'll add one thing. I've got a, I've got a bail here in a minute, but just one thing I wanted to mention, at least that was a game changer for me is getting comfortable standing up on the kayak. Um, particularly if you're in an area with like at least moderately clear water, even if it's murky water, um, the amount of extra stuff you can see, whether it's the fish themselves, ideally that's my favorite thing to do is sight fish. Or if you're in areas with a little bit more murky water, you can see some depth changes. You can see um, like a dark, like a logger or seagrass or oysters underwater. And so just getting, just getting comfortable standing up is a big deal. And so I personally, every time I go kayaking, I always bring my paddleboard paddle so that I, when I, I can, you know, you can, it's more, it's more efficient to paddle saying it's sitting down, especially if you're going into the wind. But, uh, but as soon as I get to my spot, I put my normal, you know, kayak paddle down, I pick up my paddleboard paddle, which, you know, which is just the, the big blade on one side. And now I can stand up and, and actually, you know, actually just scan and, and, and start sight fishing. So, but even without the, 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 uh, if I don't bring my paddleboard paddle, or I have forgot that. So I have forgot that one. I'll just, I'll just get the normal paddle and just paddle with that. Um, game. I know Tony does that a lot too, but that was the, that was one of the biggest things that, that helped me um, do better with fishing. Cause unlike, unlike freshwater, a lot of the, a lot of the biggest, and sometimes in many cases, the most fish are up in the shallowest water. And, uh, and so getting up there in the shallows and seeing them is, it's just such a big deal. Cool. And what about the rope? You guys are all big fans of rope, huh? Oh yeah, I'll, yeah. I mentioned row before, so I, I always carry this too. Again, this is to secure my 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 paddle to my to my side, so that way I can stand up, and I could be paddling and looking for fish. And then as soon as I see one, I just uh, put the end of the paddle in the rope, and now it's right at my side. And then I pick up the rod and cast to it. Um, so that way you don't have to like look go all down and pick up the rod from the from the bottom or lay the paddle down and create noise. You can just have everything right there. It's just all about just trying to 
to, uh, to be right there. But also I always have two ropes. I have this one to keep the paddle on my side. And then I have another one if I go out and wade fish, I'll just tie it to my waist. And, uh, and you know, if rope is the biggest thing. That, like I, I guess I'd, I would be more upset if I forgot the paddle, but like the rope is number two. Like if I don't have, if I, if I don't have the rope with me, it's, um, it's, it's upsetting. It's a, it's a, it's, it's just such a big help. And it's a small little item, it's easy to carry. Based on based somewhere. on your hair, I assume it's all 100 uh, percent organic hemp rope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have something similar, and I I left it in my truck one day, and I found a school of black drum, and I was standing up trying to cast to him, and I realized, oh crap, I don't have it on me. So I set my paddle down. As soon as I set the paddle down on the kayak, they all spooked off. Uh, Turned around, went to my truck, got it back, went to go find the fish again, started fishing. And the one I have is for like a, a big, long, regular kayak paddle. You know, you can just set it on the, uh, it's like a holster. You just set it on the holster or you can put like a hook on your belt or something like that to set it in. Just helps a lot when you're standing up and, you know, you're paddling, you see a fish, you want to be able to quickly put the paddle down, grab your rod and cast. You made a video on that one, didn't you, Tony? Yeah, we have a video how I made it and also how to use yeah, I it. Got I got to watch it, man. I, I still am so stubborn and so old fashioned and I use my paddle and I have to like flip it around and do one side and flip it around and paddle the other side. And like, I know that it's convenient. Like I stick my rod in my, in my drawers. And when I see a fish, I grab the rod out of my pants, like Excalibur and cast <laughs> and you have it. So it's so efficient how you do it. And I've seen that video telling myself, God, I got to watch that. I need to do that. I've done, you know, I've been on the flats for so many years and I still have not found a better way to do it. And you've, you figured it out. Like, that's just a really easy way to swap between your rod and the paddle and not lay things down and not make noise. And that's huge. It, yep. It's, it's really successful. You know, it's really, it's really something I got to play with. Like it's, that's, I'm making a point to do that on my next couple trips. Get on it. It, it makes a huge difference. Just like yeah. you said. Cool. And I, I know one other thing where it's, already three o'clock here um you, you have a new cart right tony do, do you want to talk about that i know you're doing a whole video on it as well yeah so kayak carts they sell all, all different types you know you have ones that fold up you have some that go into the scupper holes of the kayak and i'm not a fan of either one of those because the fold up ones they do exactly that when you're trying to pull your kayak they fold up and collapse so I don't like those. The ones that go into the scupper holes, they're nice. You know, they're secure, but number one, you're trying to get the cart into the kayak, you have to basically have nothing in your kayak so that you can tip it over, put the cart in, put the kayak upright, put all your stuff in. Then when you get to the spot, you can sort of just lift it up off and then put it on the ground. Uh, but that's just a pain because again, you have to put it into the holes. You have to turn the kayak over and all that. But the one I'm, I've been using is the wilderness systems and it, it comes apart. You know, you can take it completely apart, put it in the kayak when you're done with it, but the rails on it run like bunks. So they go from front to back on the kayak and they're about two feet long and you can strap the kayak to that. And that's been the most secure way, uh, quickest way I found to transport the kayak. And you could put different wheels on it. You could put the big balloon tires on it, or you could put the hard plastic wheels on it, uh, whichever you prefer. But if you're going to invest in a cart, definitely put some money into it. Don't go with something cheap just because you saw it on Amazon, because it probably won't work that well. And it will rust, as we found out, because we bought some cheap ones, especially if you're not using it all the time and you leave it in the garage after getting a bunch of salt water. And even if you rinse it off, it still seems to find a way to completely rust up. Ask me how I know. We've thrown a couple away. Uh, well, that's awesome. Yeah, we'll do a whole separate video. Tony's got a video coming on uh, on that. So stay tuned. Uh, otherwise, anything else, guys, uh, before we wrap it up? I think that's all about if yeah, we about covered everything there was as far as kayaks go. I'm yep, sure there's more. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah just, I'm sure we could talk about a whole lot more. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, a final note is just just love doing it. I mean, being in a kayak and being close to the water is special. It, it, you're you're like with nature in a completely different way, and uh, the community of people, us, and the community of kayak fishermen are very very tight knit. We all love the fact that the amount of effort that you put into getting out there and being successful 
uh, is, is that much more rewarding because it takes a lot of physical effort to get to the spot, get that fish, get back, load up the kayak, get home, clean down the kayak. It's, it's physically very strenuous. And I think it just makes it that much more rewarding. So if you're going to break into the sport, keep it simple, make sure you're safe and protected um, and ask us questions. We, we encourage the questions and want to hear from everybody on uh, how we can help, you know, lead you in the right direction on whatever you're going to go chase. Yep. And then join us in the insider club. We're doing new reports. The new reports going up like every five minutes now uh, in Texas over what, why it is in, you know, all the way to over here, Florida, where we are. And then up now into Virginia and even New Jersey, new reports going up every five minutes. And of course, you know, we're just trying to simplify the, the game. Uh, you, you nailed it, Justin. I mean, you, you make a big investment of both money and time. Why not maximize it? It, uh, it, it, I sit there scratching my head when I see people spend so much money on equipment and, and just overall tackle and they don't get the most out of it. It's like a 90 year old getting an iPhone 12 and all she does is make phone calls on it and text the grandkids. Uh, it's why not just get a dumb phone? Uh, so if you want to maxim, maximize everything you're spending money on and catch more fish per trip, join us in the Insider Club. That weekend game plan that we're doing every now Thursday night, Friday morning, uh, it's 10 minutes or less. So if you have 10 minutes to just watch, you can watch it on the way to your actually fishing trip to the ramp or marina, wherever you're going. And it's literally summarizing, kind of curating everything going on that week from the tides and the wind direction and moon phases and all the stuff that's important and showing you exactly what types of spots, what types of depth, uh, exactly what types of structure, and what types of lures or live bait to use to go catch inshore saltwater slams. We do it every single weekend. And a new thing we're going to be adding for insider members, this, uh, most, most probably don't even know this, so if you're watching, this is going to be a cool bonus that's starting uh, the first week of March. Uh, we are going to be doing very similar calls to this live just for our members where you can ask anything if you're fishing that week and are going to a new spot uh it is going to be just a, a basically just a free coaching call that we do every single the first thursday of every month uh for our members and uh it's unlimited for any insiders who want to get on obviously we're going to record it and if you have questions that you want because if you're going to miss the call uh for whatever reason work etc then let us know and we will answer your questions. But it's completely free coaching. It's like having a fishing guide in your back pocket, and that's going to be free to all Insider members starting on March the 1st. Just one more reason to become an Insider member. We also have some really cool tackle coming up. We've been working on some chum for quite some time now. Uh, you guys have seen it in a few videos and ha have asked about it. We have our own custom chum coming up. We have what a some new uh, custom rods coming up. We'll have a whole new whole new lineup of reels coming in very soon. Those are not custom to Salt Strong, but it's just been crazy tough to get reels. As you know, we had those Daiwas, and uh, they sold out crazy, crazy fast. But we have a whole nother uh, big, big, big pallets full of uh, of reels coming on the way and of course our members get up to 20 percent off everything there at fishstrong.com so fishstrong.com is the store saltstrong.com to learn more about the insider club almost twenty thousand members or so now it's right there on that on that line uh crazy how fast it's growing and we just appreciate you all i've seen a lot of current insider members who are watching this day thank you guys so much uh, that community is just becoming so awesome. We've taken off of Facebook. Thank you, Facebook, for letting us do some free Facebook lives. But we, you know, there is so much negativity and so much just just trash out there on Facebook. The the whole insider community is all Facebook. It's completely built from scratch at community.saltstrong.com. Uh, check it out. It's where we personally spend most of our time answering questions and putting our fishing report, showing exactly where we're fishing every single week. So guys, thank you so much. Uh, the crew here, Wyatt, Tony, Justin, thank you guys. Looks like Luke had to bail on us. Uh, this is a fun one and we'll go through some of these questions. I know we didn't get a chance to get to all of them because we all had so much to share and talk about, about kayak fishing, but uh, we'll make sure to go through here. And uh, I know Tony and Wyatt will spend a little time looking at any questions we didn't get to. We'll make, we'll make personal videos for it. Uh, so guys, thank you so much. Hit us up if you're watching recording of this. Uh, make sure to leave some questions. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify, which it'll be there on YouTube, uh, definitely post comments down below or on saltstrong.com in the fishing tips section. It'll come right to us. Otherwise, we be out. Good job, guys. Peace. Peace, guys.